For the last 45 years, our brotherhood has been distributing to all the families in our congregation a candle that we light to usher in Yom HaShoah. And as you know, those candles, each of them, carries with it the name of a man, woman, or child who was murdered in the Shoah. And all of us begin Yom HaShoah by lighting that candle and thinking about that person, that innocent, who was slain. Well, a few weeks before Yom HaShoah, our members, Barbara and Steve Grossman, dropped by the temple office a folder. And in the folder was 45 years' worth of names. They never threw out that scrap of paper. They never threw out, threw out that name. They held on to the names and revisit the names every year. So they've now got 45 years' worth of names. Now, I'm not going to read all of them, but just to give you a sense of the infinite weight. In 1994, they remembered Esther Kligerman. In 1995, Rizel Farbman. In 1996, Moshe Bekel. In 1997, they remembered Elsie Paradise. In 1998, Samuel Hirsch Kornblatt. In 1999, Therese Newberg. In 2000, Moshe Fish. In 2001, Gertrude Meidener. And so it goes for 45 years. And for each of those 45 years, they would ask themselves the question that we always ask every year, where was the rest of the world? What was the rest of the world doing when these innocents were being murdered? That was always the question every other year's Yom HaShoah. But Manishtana, Yom HaShoah Hazeh, Mikol Yomei HaShoah. Why is this year's Yom HaShoah? that we marked on Wednesday night and Thursday. Why is it different? How is it different from every other Yom HaShoah that we ever marked? And the answer is that in every other year, we asked, where was the rest of the world? And what was the rest of the world doing when this was happening? And this year, we are the rest of the world. And this year, the question is, What are we doing? Every one of us, 100% of us, wakes up every morning and on every screen are atrocities and war crimes and brutalization and murder, not from the 1941 to 1945, but happening today in real time. Civilian places like train stations, civilian places like apartment complexes, civilian places like theaters, bomb destroyed, innocent slain, bodies in body bags, too numerous to bury. We've all learned of cities that we didn't even know existed like Bukha, that are now the scene of atrocities too heinous to even name. Now, we are not indifferent. We're not indifferent. We know, and we care. We just don't know what to do about it. Yes, we can and we have written our elected representatives help Ukraine. Most of us have done that. Yes, we can and we have given resources For Ukrainian relief, most of us have done that. So we've done what we know what to do, but the brutalization and the murder still happening every day. And on Yom HaShoah, therefore, we have to confront 
the vast gulf between the mantra of never again and the reality of again and again every day. How do we think about that problem? So I want to share with you today two stories and a piece of artwork. And I hope the piece of artwork, which actually is outside in the Leventhal Sidman Community Court, it's a few feet from here, you can see it after service is over. I'd love that piece of artwork to haunt you all the days of your life. And perhaps with these two stories and a haunting piece of artwork, each of us can construct our own response to this problem that we're committed to never again, and the reality is again and again. First story takes place in 1993, and a young black teenager named Louis D. Brown, age 15, is killed by a fatal crossfire in Dorchester. Now, by all accounts, Louis D. Brown, an amazing young man, incredibly intelligent, incredibly hardworking, deeply idealistic, deeply noble. He dreamed of going to college. He dreamed of getting a PhD in engineering. And this is 1993. He dreamed of growing up to become the first black president of the United States. And he happened to have been killed by a stray bullet while on the way to organize a rally against gun violence. He's killed by gun violence on the night that he's organizing against gun violence, and he's so noble, and so pure, and so idealistic, and so hardworking, and so good, and so innocent, and so dead from a stray bullet, and so 15. How does one even begin to respond? By the way, gun violence, also intractable. By the way, gun violence, also the kind of thing that we always say never again. And it's always again and again. So here's what his mother, Tina Cherry, did. She created a, an institute named for her son the Lewis D. Brown Peace Institute. And the mission of it is to provide healing and education to all families affected by gun violence. She wants to have compassion and learning and healing for families that are the victims of gun violence, like her own, and compassion and healing and learning for families of the incarcerated. She wants to bring all of these families together in a tough and troubled world so that there can be greater understanding and love. That was Tina Cherry's response to the loss of her son. By the way, in addition, she also does every year a Mother's Day Walk for Peace, which is next Sunday. We're joining it. By the way, she's coming tonight. She's going to be in dialogue tonight with her artist, Karen Tabb. She met Karen Tabb because she was talking about the institute named for her son. And when Karen Tabb, this artist, heard about the unimaginable loss of life, a 15-year-old, on the way to organize against gun violence, killed by gun violence. And then his, his mother, who doesn't jump off a bridge and who doesn't stay home and never leaves, who found an institute for her son's memory trying to bring families together, Karen had to somehow come up with a piece of art 
that in her own way could respond to the infinite poignancy and loss and resilience of the story. So here's what she does. She takes a familiar trope of Jewish tradition, the tzedakah box, and she drops the hay, and it becomes a tzedek box. Tzedakah box is a charity box. A tzedek box is a justice box. She turns a charity box into a justice box. Now, we all know what to do with a tzedakah box. We all have tzedakah boxes, charity boxes, in our homes. They're in our schools. They're in our sisterhood windows. And the charity boxes in our sisterhood windows actually come from our homes, families here offering them on loan. And we know the move. We write a check. Could be a bigger check. Could be a smaller check. But it's discreet and it's doable. By the way, thank God the Jewish people got this memo and that we know what to do with the tzedakah box. Because just consider what's happened since February 24th with CJP. CJP has raised $3.6 million dollars for emergency humanitarian relief for Ukrainians, which already, Dayenu, is the greatest single response to a relief effort in the history of CJP. $3.6 million, plus, in addition, another $5.8 million raised for refugee resettlement, meaning that CJP has raised $9.5 million dollars in two months. The power of a tzedakah box, where we know what to do. But a tzedakah box, Lord, that's just a totally different thing. A tzedakah box, what does it mean to give justice? Like, I don't even know what that means. That's like poetry, that's ethereal, that's celestial, that's that's like capturing a cloud. What am I going to do? Give justice. By the way, it's crazy for me now. I got an elderly parent. What am I supposed to be doing giving justice? I got an adult child who's struggling. How am I going to give justice? By the way, my business is disrupted. My income flow is disrupted. Everything is disrupted. By the way, I got depression in my family. I got depression in my family. I got edge. I got anxiety. I got financial woes. I got health woes. I got worry. The people in my life and my own family are not doing well. What does it mean, give Justice. I can give a check. I know what that means. What's a, what's a justice box? So here's what I want to tell you. Keep your tzedakah box and keep doing what you're doing with it. And don't give up your tzedakah box. Don't give up that question What justice am I going to give? That question, what justice am I going to give, is much harder than what check am I going to write. But let me tell you a story about why the game is worth the candle. Let me tell you a story about why you should be haunted by your tzedek box. Because what's at stake is infinite. Wednesday night, Paula Absell was talking about the hidden story of resistance during the Holocaust. And she talked about the traditional notion that Jews went katzon la tevach yuval, like sheep to the slaughterhouse. And she said, not so, that there was sustained and systemic Resistance, which took many forms, and one of the forms was that the Nazis did not allow babies, Jewish babies in Jewish ghettos, and the Nazis would kill Jewish babies in Jewish ghettos, and there was a couple, parents, young parents, in Kovno, Lithuania, who showed resistance to this evil Nazi decree. They had a baby daughter. 
They didn't want their baby daughter to be murdered by the Nazis. And so they came up with a plan. They're going to put their baby daughter in a potato sack and smuggle her out of the ghetto like a sack of potatoes. And to do this, they had to drug her so she should fall asleep and drug her so she should stay asleep when the person carrying what seemed to be a sack of potatoes but was their little daughter shouldn't be discovered by the Nazis. So they do this, and she somehow is able to get past the Nazis, and she's taken to a Gentile family that raises her for six years, and after the Holocaust, she is reunited with her Jewish family. And Paula is doing a film on Jewish resistance, and then you see this person who had been a baby in a potato sack, and now she's a grown woman named Dana Mazurkevich. And she starts telling her story, and somehow there's film, actual film of Dana as a baby being smuggled out past the Nazis, and Dana as a woman is telling this story. Dana Mazurkovich is alive, telling the story about Dana Mazurkovich as a baby. All of that is Dayenu enough, Dayenu enough. Like, we're all just stunned. Like, oh my God, oh my God, Paula, thank you for that. But not done. Paula says, Dana Mazurkovich is here tonight in the Rabbi Chill Sanctuary, and she stands up. And the stunned crowd can't believe it. This baby in a potato sack survived. This baby in a potato sack is alive. This baby in a potato sack is a Temple Emanuel in the program which tells her story. It's just like, oh my God, who can even take that in? So the next morning I called Paula. And I said, Paula, oh my God, Dana, oh my God, what, how, where, tell me, what's the backstory? So it turns out that Dana lives 10 minutes from Paula. Turns out that Dana lives in Brookline, Massachusetts. And here's the backstory Dana's parents, those desperate parents who are trying to subvert the evil Nazi decree and schlep their baby out in a potato sack by drugging her first. Before the Nazis, they had a day job. And before the Nazis, their day job was they were virtuoso violinists. Both her mother and her father. And Dana Mazurkevich grows up to become a virtuoso violinist. And as a young woman, she goes to Moscow and studies at the Moscow Conservancy with the world leader, violinist, teacher, where she also meets her husband, Yuri, who is, you'll never guess it, a virtuoso violinist. And now she teaches violin at Boston University. Now just step back and imagine what's going on here. You have a baby in a potato sack who is drugged, who is taken out of the Nazi ghetto. And because she's alive, she gets to grow up. And because she's alive, she gets to become a wife and a mother and a grandmother and a musician and a teacher. Can you even imagine all those names on all those notes on all those candles, all those 45 years that we've been lighting? What they could have become, who they could have become, the good they could have done, the healing they could have offered, the insights they could have given humanity the songs they could have sung and the books they could have written and the love they could have shared and the families they could have built 
and the generations they could have brought into the world if only they had been allowed to live, but they weren't. But Dana was. Dana embodies the Talmud's teaching that if you save one life, you save the whole universe. And that's why I want you and I want me and I want us to be haunted. 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 By Karen Tabb's Sedek box. It's outside in the atrium. Don't give up on that question, what justice can I give? It's a hard question. A tzedek box is so much harder than a tzedakah box. Writing a check, easier. Giving justice, so much harder. But if we can figure it out, if we can even in some small way do our version of what Tina Cherry did, if we can even in our small way do something to save a life, then what we create is as beautiful as a violin being played by a maestro who has been to hell and back and now lives 10 minutes from here in the holy city of Brookline. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>